Hey guys, make sure you use the promo code ADDISON20 for 20% off of Dr. Price's electrolytes. You know whether on the road or in Europe, it's keeping us hydrated. Again, 20% off ADDISON20, link in the bio. Booyah Kasha, welcome back to another episode of If You Can't Handle the Heat presented by Out of System. There's only two of us here today, though, again, but it's a different two. Last week it was just Gage and I, but we're back with the OG. Subbed them out. Yeah, we subbed them out. It's it's back to the OG crew. It's funny because the whole last year, Gage would give us crap for for being in Europe and our Wi-Fi being down or whatever issues with technology. In the first week, he gets the Bulgaria. <laughs> he has the exact issue that we ran into. He's no Wi-Fi. I'm like, bro. So Mike and I were, were talking about how ironic that was. We're missing I it. I remember, but... well, I remember my first couple days, I didn't have Wi-Fi in, um, in France at all for like the first week. And I ran out of, I, I just kept buying gigabytes on my T-Mobile plan. And then I like, I don't know why, but I couldn't anymore. So I, we, what we did was we got this like little router that gives you like a hundred gigabytes. And well, Zana was there with me. We blew through that thing. Cause we'd watch movies. We'd like, she stayed home alone. We blew that thing through that thing in like three days and then didn't have internet for like another week. So we were pretty bored. Oh, I can imagine. Yeah. I mean, yeah. over here, like Germany especially is known to have some of the worst cell service and Wi-Fi in all of Europe. It's crazy. I, yeah, I have no idea. Like, it's so bad. It makes no sense. No sense. I couldn't believe it. I'm like driving through like big cities and there's just no service. I'm like, how is this possible in a country yeah, like Germany? That doesn't make any sense. I feel like they'd probably be my bet for the best Yeah. in all of Europe. I know, I know before we hopped on here, you were telling me that, so Mike had just got to Poland last night for anybody, uh, 1 a.m. Yeah. He just finally got into Poland. Everybody, all of us are now in Europe. And you were telling me something about your phone almost letting you down, but I didn't let you tell it. I want you to tell me the uh, story on the podcast here. So basically what happened was I was about to leave and my phone just started shutting off. So it shuts off on me twice. I finally turn it back on and I can't like touch it or anything. And so I am packing because it's like I'm a last minute packer and I have like 30 minutes to leave and a bunch of my apps come back on, but they're like blank. And so I'm trying to search for my Gmail, which was easy because there's the red notification of how much like notifications you have was still there. So I'm like, oh, sweet. So I click on that. But anyways, I was looking to print my work permit and my COVID results and I couldn't. And so I actually got to, I don't know why I did this, but I, but it worked out. I did the update, the iOS update. <laughs> I had 30 minutes and I forgot that these things take that long. And so I had to end up waiting uh, for it to go all the way through. And then finally, when I rebooted it, it worked and luckily I made it on time, but it wasn't a Mexico thing. I made it. So that's another did thing. We, People were asking we about Mexico. About that? No, we haven't of why you didn't go to Mexico. We, we got DM'd about it too, because people knew you were training there, but it will. Yeah. It wasn't that he got cut. It was, no, uh, there were some other reasons. Well, what happened was we had three setters, me, Josh, Tuninga, and um, Matt West. Matt West, the first day, has COVID. So we called up a third setter, or actually a fourth setter, which is Sam Coburn. And turns out that fourth setter goes to Mexico, which is hilarious. But I'm sitting with Sam, and my some of the USA administration told me, like, hey, you didn't do this thing. You have to come and do it. So I came in and signed it. And then they're like, you know, I don't know if this is going to go through. And I'm telling Sam, like, Sam, this is not going to go through. <laughs> You're going. And they're like, eh, we'll see if it goes through. We'll see. And I'm telling Sam, like, Sam, 
I'm not going through this. Guarantee this is not going through. And he's like, no way. If you know who Sam Coburn is, you know how he talks. He's like, no way, dude. No way. And I'm like, dude, I'm dead serious. So we're sitting there on the couch on a Saturday. We leave uh, Monday, I think, at like 6 a.m. And they call me and they're like, hey, Michael. I'm like, hey, how's it going, coach? He's like, yeah, you can't get on the flight. And I'm like, sitting, I'm like, all right, I'll give the phone to Sam. Get the phone to Sam, and they're like, all right, Sam, we're booking your flight for Mexico right now. And he's like, what? Like, no way. He just kept saying no way. It's so funny <laughs> if you know who how he is. But, yep, couldn't get on that flight. So, all good, though. It's all good. It happens. Oh, happens it's all good. Of us. You almost played the Manhattan Beach Open, too. People were – so, that so then <laughs> I last minute was like, hey, if anybody wants to play in the um, Manhattan Beach Open, I'm super down. But it, it was so late that they had to already be signed up and have an injury. I still almost made it in. Somebody somebody had an injury, and I was, like, ready to go. And then he's like, oh, my partner's just going to try his best to stick it out. So I was like, yeah, of course. Like, he's signed up for it, and he's probably been training for it. I just showed up. Like, I'd way rather <laughs> him play. I'm just saying I'm here if you need me. But it would have been really fun. Um, TJ played in that, and TJ is a phenomenal beach player. Yeah. Like gnarly, ph- gnarly, phenomenal. But he's been playing it. We never played beach like he did. He played nah. it in like the youth Olympics. He's played it in junior. Like he's traveled for beach and trained beach. Yeah. So it may, that makes sense. We've we've never done that. We've that traveled was... and played threes. Yeah. He hasn't done that. He hasn't done that. But doubles, <laughs> doubles, he'd probably take us down. He's legit. That's literally how I felt like when I showed up to this King of the Court thing. They called me up last week. Oh, dude, you got to talk about this. What on earth were you guys doing in that thing? I see you two clowns walking out. There's fireworks. I'm like, why did they get into this thing? What are they doing? There's again like professional guys that were in the Olympics. I'm dude, like, Olympians. We were playing I'm like, like Stein <laughs> and Joe. You're not even from the same country. Everyone else has one flag next to their name. Then there's these two clowns with the USA and Netherlands flag out there. Oh my Dude, God. Out wait, there shaking hands. Wait like, till you what hear is the, going on? Wait till you hear the funniest. This is, I thought, at this point, I'm like, oh, this is just, they're setting us up just to look like complete fools. So I get a call, like, literally Tuesday, last Tuesday, I, I get out of wait. I have seven missed calls from Stein. He's like, call me back ASAP. He tells me that, that teams have dropped out of the king of the court and Stein knows the director and the director called Stein like, Hey, we need another team. And Stein says, the only way I play is if I get to pick my own partner. <laughs> guy's like, all right, fine. <laughs> so he calls me. I'm like, all right. And the whole week Stein was like freaking out. He said, we got to practice. I'm like, bro, practice ain't going to do anything for us. No, <laughs> we just got to show up. And we practiced one time for this thing. But uh, the funny thing, I didn't realize till the night before, because they had the pools posted earlier in the week, but then they had teams drop out. We were the replacements for Anders Christian and Christian. Uh, oh, sorry, Anders you were? Christian. Because you go and look, and literally they just took our names and inserted us into the one seed of the pool. <laughs> you were the ones? Oh, my word. And, bro, when, when we showed up, oh, my. Actually, there was a decent amount of people who knew, like, out of system were asking about it, or Hawaii fans. Really? And the first day, dude, we played, we were so bad. We were horrible. <laughs> and I'm like, all right, the next morning, I'm like, all right, sorry, we got to go and like train for like two hours. We got, we can't embarrass ourselves. Oh, so, so you guys went and trained. So we played like a couple of the Dutch teams and some of the Norwegian teams. We were out there for like two and a half hours. And then we played way better the day, but the, that night. Okay. And the whole crowd is getting behind us because everybody knew that we were. Everyone just, knows like these guys are yeah. ridiculous. <laughs> I can't dude, believe these guys are out here. Dude, Stein, I was just making jokes the whole time. Like, bro, these guys got to be like, when they see that we're in their pool, they're like, yes, we got these guys. Oh, yeah. They filled, uh, they took out the best team in the world and put you guys in there. That is a steal. <laughs> you should have seen us. Like, what do you get if you win that? Could you guys have won money? 10000 We still got money. We still got, we got uh, 350 apiece. You could have won 10000 Yeah. If you in win one the- day? Yeah, if you well, you, no, 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 you have to win the whole tournament. Oh, how long is the tournament? It's like three days, but it's king of the court. I don't know if. You've oh seen wow, how it's, it's and dude, 
The teams are gnarly. <laughs> there was no oh, shot. Yeah. No, I know. I'm like, dude. Oh, my the team God. who was, was in just, our the Polish team. It was just team. ridiculousness oh. that you were in that. It was so funny, dude. I was That's dying so laughing. Awesome. The funny thing is, I show up on. And it's so official. Yeah, it's, not, it's, it's super not supposed official. supposed to be a ragtag thing. Super official. It's like, like you guys have jerseys, and I, and I'm looking at you guys like. <laughs> Bro, the day before, what are they doing? I didn't like. I knew it was official, but I didn't realize how official it was. And I heard like which arena we were playing. I'm like, oh, this is like a nice ass arena. And the day before, like, I had indoor practice the whole week. We had double days, and we played Friday night. And Thursday, I get this text in the middle of the morning, like, "You have to come for pictures today." And there's a players meeting. I'm like, I was literally just gonna show up before we play the next day. <laughs> like, no, yeah. all these oh. teams are like out there. Training. So you went. And took the photos and then came back for practice Friday? Out. So listen. No, no, no. Listen to this. That third. No, I had to be there Thursday. I got the text Thursday morning. I had to be there Thursday afternoon. Where is it? Hamburg, an hour away. So I finished weights and I book it and I literally had to time it. I got to practice 30 seconds before practice started. I was like throwing all my stuff in the car at stoplights and stuff. But bro, no, the funny thing is when I showed up for pictures, I was like texting the director because Stein went later that day. He got in later. And I was like texting and I show up to the hotel, which is like a couple of miles away. And they're like, no, 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 you gotta come to the arena. This is where the pictures are. I'm like, oh Lord. They're like, you gotta come to the players, the players uh, uh, like lounge. I'm like, where's that? <laughs> and I'm like, what is yeah. that? And they're like, oh, you just gotta come to the competition desk. I'm like, what competition desk? <laughs> they're like, where it usually is in the players lounge. I'm like, where's it usually at? I've never played in one of these. <laughs> Like, and then at that point, they're just like, he's like, dude, just talk to Maria. Like, Maria, who? <laughs> Bro, I was getting so many messages. They're like, how the hell did you guys get in this thing? And I was laughing like the real. whole time, dude. I'm like, it this almost is so like ridiculous. A sp- a, like a, like a, is it called a spoof? Is that what yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it, it was, almost looks like that. Dude, it oh, it was. Real. Oh, no. Ch- we were sitting there like. Wait, I can't hear you anymore. Oh. We were we were sitting there at meals, and dude, we we're just like Tola Vickler. We we're sitting there with like all the top teams. We we're sitting there talking. It's just us there, just chopping, dude. The breakfast at this hotel. We stayed in the nicest hotel in Hamburg. The breakfasts were amazing. Dude, the food was amazing. So good. We had a freaking great time. It was a great experience. But, oh no, I'm sure that is so sick. It was a, uh, yeah, it was. It was an awesome That's time. so sick. All right, let's get Brad on, huh? Yeah, we're to get – for all those you guys saw in our story last night, Brad Keller, head coach, USC men's volleyball, one of the top coaches in the world in my eyes. <laughs> top recruiter. He's coming on. On next year. Thank you very much to Dr. Price's Vitamins. Again, Dr. Price's Electrolytes. Sorry, click the link below. They're the one who are partners with us. Check it out. All right, let's get Brad on. And like we said, we don't do this very often. We don't bring on the same guests multiple times. There's very few people that we've brought on twice. And with the women's season coming up here, we wanted to bring on the expert himself of women's vol- women's men's recruiting, anything you got. And the hybrid we, were, coach. we were talking about, Coach, we were talking about, like, this guy has a match tomorrow, and he's coming on the podcast. And then I looked up the schedule. I'm like, well, it's against the University of Denver. So we're like – Maybe that's why he's like University of Denver. I can just cruise, hop on some podcasts. <laughs> no, like, it is like... not. No, it is not. Denver is really good, by the way. We watched a video of them uh, yesterday and started prepping, and um, they've been top two or three in their conference every year. They make deep runs or deep dives into the NCAA tournament. So they're like that team. There's a couple teams like that, like Creighton and Western Kentucky. USD. I mean, there's there's like teams that are always just no matter what they're good, and Denver is a destination spot and a really great place. And he's doing Tom Tom Hogan is his name. He's doing a great job there. They're really getting it going. So, so no. yes, I'm on the podcast because I love you guys. <laughs> yes, I am stressed out, and yes, uh, we are 100 miles an hour ready to rock and roll for this season, and I'm pretty excited about it. So. We'll keep it short. We we just Joe just said he's like I'm gonna look up when their first game is, so I'm not out of the loop. He's like, dude, yeah, it's tomorrow. Right. I feel so bad. No, it's but, good. Uh, that's your good. first game of the regular season. 
Yeah. I always, I always joke that this is actually my first year. I don't count last year. I don't know if yeah. anyone else does, but so I, I say it's not two, I'll give you 1.5, but it's not two. It's not year right. two. So this is year one for us all over again, like the real year one. And we'll see how it goes. How are you guys looking? I, uh, I was just talking to my staff about that. I, it's interesting to really dive into it. I don't know how good we are and I'm not trying to downplay it or I just don't know where we are. Um, it's an amazing gym as far as the attitude and the effort. And I think that I have just really pounced on that because at the end of the day, the systems and everything else that we're going to be doing is going to develop the connection. All these other things are going to develop over time, but you can't do it in week one. It's, it's going to be sloppy no matter what. But if you have a bad attitude or you don't have good effort in your gym, you are, you have no shot. So I love kind of what that component is right now. And I'm really enjoying being around the staff and the kids. We got seven new faces. So it's, it's, it's awesome right now. You got, you got Josh's sister this year. I got Josh's sister. Yes. Is she going to be playing? She is going to have really good opportunities this season. She is in a nice little setter battle, and she is, she's the real deal. I have two setters. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I have four really, really, really good setters, and um, those two. There's two of them right now that are kind of in a, a, a lock or a battle for the early part of the season, and I've I've been able to say now, and it's true. It's to a lot of players because we have a little bit more depth. You may be ready, but it's it's not your time. And you've got to like stay in there and 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 stay the course and be positive and work on your game and help this team out and everything. And so, um, it's been really really good. But she's she's really good, guys. She's really good. And she's, oh, I know, I know. I've been like watching Josh, her she, like, smack smack yeah. balls around forever. Yeah, she's same personality. It's mellow, diffuses everything. Like I got you, coach. It's it's great. Don't worry about it. Um, yeah. and she's been around it. Right. So like, there's a lot of things that she does that no one else does because she's been around the game or been around players like you and Josh and TJ and George, like all these guys that played at such a high level. So she's seen it since she's been what, 10, you know, like whatever it is. So she knows. So, um, and she's, she's an amazing person. So totally. No, that family is an incredible family. Great and family. An even Talking bigger about- pickup though. Yeah. Oh, who? Sabrina Smith from Campo Lindo High School. I know. Campo. Right. I. You got both. Well, both of them went. I don't know. Many people know Sabrina Smith, Sam Cobrin are dating. Yep. As far as I know still. Um, yep. And you as got far them as both. I know too. <laughs> and you got them both to transfer. So that's pretty huge. Too, <laughs> I didn't like. have anything to do with Sam Cobrin at all. Sam was um, with men's volleyball. Um, didn't even talk to him. But uh Sabrina, I mean, our four transfers are Paige Hammonds from Florida, Shannon Scully from Pepperdine, uh, Mia Tuaniga uh, from Long Beach State, and then Sabrina Smith uh, from UCLA. And all four individuals, uh, unbelievable maturity, professionals, positive attitude, been there, done that, been told they're not good enough at some point in their career and have, like, overcome that, Um it's just, it, and it's really, really weird seeing Sabrina in Cardinal and Gold. Like me, like I walk in the gym and she's there and I'm like <laughs> trying to, hey, how we doing? All right, nice shirt. And we just keep going. Totally. So, but um, I tell everybody if uh, if you don't like Sabrina Smith and it's a you issue, that's what yeah, I know she's about Sabrina. Awesome. She is yeah. awesome. You talked about that setter battle. Um mm-hmm. How important is it, because we were just talking about this on the Norseka team, um, to define roles and how long do you let people battle it out or how long do you let those kinds of things go on until you think it's more beneficial for the team for you to, even if you're wrong, to set roles and have everybody understand where they are um, so that there's more people are able to do what they have to do and, uh, better and know what they have to do. Uh, a little bit more clear. Well, I'm actually glad you asked that. That's actually a hot topic right now, especially with uh, conversations I've had with other coaches, my own staff, and what we're doing. Um, 
Marv Dunphy, I believe, said you need to define rules very fast and get it going no matter what. You've got to get going in the right direction and you cannot mess around too long. And I always believe that. And I think that if you're on a national team or you're, I mean, like, for example, the, the women's gold, a gold medal team or like whatever teams are out there, you need to define roles. I also think, and this is where it, I don't, I got to go more into this. I, I don't know that that's right for college volleyball. If a player comes into my office now and says, I need you to tell me what my role is. Part of me thinks that's not the right response. You should keep coming in going, what do I need to do to start? I'm fine with that. And how can I help this team move forward? So there's a little bit of selfishness in that. And I think our society has gone that route where we have to have these rules. So like Micah, you're our serving sub, but all of a sudden now, someone else is serving better than you. I'm going to play that person. It's no longer your role right. at that moment in time. Or right. maybe you are going to, maybe you're playing, you're the setter and now you're playing outside and all of a sudden you're playing better than the other person. Like we've defined these roles. No, we, like mm. the role should be, in my opinion, to come in every single day and compete at the highest level, work hard for the team, be a great teammate, you know, abide and live by what our, our rules and regulations and our standards are and have a ton of pride in what this, university is this program and everything else and i think that's where the true value is so i don't know where i lie on that i think i'm somewhere in the middle and we're in the middle of that like i don't know right. i'm gonna play people i'm gonna try certain things out i'm gonna explore well i definitely think it's best when roles are defined but also fluid like you said mm -hmm. um and then when they are up to change them being pretty like out in the open for change, like, or like no doubt. discussed about instead of like <clears throat> thrown into it and then not talked about and so like leaving yeah. just from what I've heard from a lot of people, especially people um, that don't have even as big of a role. Cause obviously the big guy knows my role is to go in there yeah. and hit the ball and yeah. dominate and lead, but it's people that can add, but don't know exactly where um, that are like looking for, for direction. I would mm -hmm. say, um, and I think sometimes nowadays they're not, it's such a free, open-minded, like sort of movement in sport that coaches overlook how much kids do want to be told, like what to do. Yep. Agreed. Um, and, and there is I that totally balance agree. where the new school is like, Hey, let them lead themselves and teach them or like those kinds of things. And the old school, it's like, do this and do it now. Yeah. That's right. Um, so I, I was just wondering where you, if you want to touch I, on that, I'm, where are you? I'm in a that? transition phase right now. I don't really know. Um, I'm really intrigued by it. I think there's a balance between the two. I do think this, no matter what, and I think you hit it right on the head, is you have to be super transparent and consistent with your players on your team and as players to your coach. It's a great learning opportunity to like, at the end of the day, you want to know that I believe in you or that you have an opportunity or that you are in a safe environment where you can be the very best you and you can help this program out and be something, uh, be a part of something bigger than yourself. I think all those things are kind of waters or water is wet statements or like those are what, but like how you do that gets lost in translation quite a bit. And I think that's that, that's where a lot of coaches struggle i mean I, I and i probably would be one too like are you the relationship coach do you hold a certain standard are you great with x's and o's do you know nothing about x's and o's or i mean there's so many different avenues and if you can get bland of everything and you have touch points on all those areas i think that you'll be pretty successful you have a pretty good shot especially with the athletes uh coming in today because all of the athletes coming in are so smart and they're 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 on top of it and they're not weak and they're not i mean they're just they're they're in a different age it's like the same old saying almost this is, this is a stretch but it's like it's like my dad playing old school rock and roll and i like hip-hop you know and he's gonna be like you have no idea what you got hip-hop is, is crap and you should be listening to rock and roll i don't know hip-hop's great edm's great country's great there's a lot of different things out there and the more that you're able to expand and be open and also know kind of these are like 
here's my absolute. I absolute this, absolute that, absolute this. And you can go back and touch on those points to them. I think it really helps out in the relationship component, role def definition, uh, encouragement, all that stuff. I think, yeah. I think, Micah, there's one word that stuck out with me about all that was really great stuff is like the leadership component, especially for like new coach like yourself. When a, when a coach steps in and they assign those roles really early, it's also <coughs> really clear to the team, like who's our who's going to be like the core of this group? Who's the leadership of our, of this group? And I think that's also a super important point is like, okay, as a new coach, who am I coming in and trying to build this program around? Uh, because you see, I see all the time. I don't know. I, I, over the summer we, I was in LA and you just talk to, and you meet a bunch of athletes from a bunch of different schools and you just hear about a bunch of crap that goes on. It's like the cult, it's the issue is the culture at the bottom of the line and, and the coaches, just saying allowing too much free flow also, I think could be an issue as well. And so I don't know, I think there hundred percent has to be a balance. Um, but in the leadership component, so huge, I think to assign those roles. And that's why I think like someone like Marv, he does that oh, yeah. probably, that's probably a huge component. It's like, these, these are my guys, like that's who I'm playing with. And, uh, and it's a little bit old school, but at the same time, I can see why it could work in a way because you don't want stuff getting in between certain players and certain relationships. And so it, it's just, have you ever, have you guys ever heard of issues at Pepperdine when, when Marv was there? David Hunt too, but like Marv, I mean, I felt like no one ever walked out of there and said they hated their experience at Pepperdine when they played for Marv, you know, they yeah, worship they, they, him. They, they, yeah. They yeah. worship him. They and were they, Marv's, they, they, Marv's they talk like him. They have more. Yeah. They're Marv's and, warriors. Yeah. That's what they'd always say. Yeah. Marv soldiers. And I, I, you know, and I, again, I don't know this for a fact. So, I mean, someone else can spot check it, but I, I heard that Marv had a role for everybody and every drill and every practice. So if you're the guy that's handing volleyballs to the coach, you had to have pride in that and do that. And your name was on the board and you had, it was very specific as to what everyone was doing at every single time. And you know, it's like he, it, he don't be late to the bus and don't do these. I mean, he was just very, and he was very non, I heard he was non, he never yelled or, or got into it. He just kind of said, Oh, we all make mistakes. Here we go. Let's go run the hill or whatever it was. You know, these are the stories that came out. And like you said, people worshiped him. They still do. He's regal, you know? And, and so I think that he really embodied a great culture, for example, and his style and what he did. So where is, because I would think Marv would be considered more of a old school guy. Yeah. Um, I would say Sparrow is probably on the cutting edge of new school. No doubt. Um, and when I talk to certain people, I see that old school is less quantitative, like less mathematics, less statistics. New school is more science driven and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. I've always talked about the art of coaching itself. And mm -hmm. this is not, this is not to say which, which one is better, but do you think that the art of coaching has changed to like the science of coaching where it's not like say at UCLA, there's North campus and South campus where like North is the arts or something and South yeah. is math. And it's moved from more of like an art about getting the best out of your kids and like not necessarily crunching numbers. Like you have a statistician for that. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's not what's pushing the team to nowadays, even like in baseball, you see how heavy statistics are going on and the mathematics and at the top levels are going, are insane. Where's the balance yep. of that? And where can the art of coaching? Cause I think of guys like Saban or like old school yeah. guys that are in the sec coaching football that are just like, just characters that can get a lot out of their guys. Yeah. Where do you balance that? What do you think about that? Is that a true statement at all? Does that have any validity? Oh yeah. I think that we are constantly trying to figure out what it's, uh, I think Joe said it's about, it's, it's fluid. Like it's always changing. It is not a black and white thing. I think that every year you pick up different styles and different things that worked with that team. That does not mean it works with the next team. You could have a team that's all about analytics. You could have a team that needs that personal touch. You may have a team that actually does like to be yelled at. I mean, there are pe people are different. There's all sorts of different styles. I think, Isn't that where the art lies, though? Yes. That's and where I, the more old school approach is, where it's like, yes, I yell at it. I like you understand the personalities and how to get things out of them instead yep. of like cookie cutter. 
numbers is going to do it all. If you're if you're yelling at a player, you should earn the right to, to yell at that player. Like there should not be that player should never walk away and say, feel like that was a personal attack. That player should be in vigor or like into it or like, like yeah, I get it. Or they, they're motivated. Like you're trying to mo- you're trying to help them allegedly. If you're suppose if you're yelling at them, you're trying to get them going, right? You're trying to right cattle brawl them or whatever whatever the term would be but you're trying to get them going can ask my dad about that yeah (laughs) but your dad but i'll tell you what here's the interesting part so your dad would be considered old school right i mean he's just like (laughs) hardcore (laughs) old school but those kids that played for him knew that he cared and still do like roger you know roger cares and if you know that a coach cares then you're will you will be willing to quote unquote run through the brick wall if you believe in the vision and it's 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 consistent it's whatever the problem that coaches have is if if you're going to be a jackass and be a jackass but don't be a jackass and be a nice guy and then be a this guy and then be a that guy no if you're a jackass be a jackass if you're a numbers guy be a numbers guy like give the the players a consistency where they can know where you are and how to feed off of you and you know when coaches have massive impacts on their programs because the kids start acting and walking and talking like those coaches. Totally. It's just a thing. So there's a coach that stands out to me at UCLA that probably like Marv, everyone that came in like worshipped her. <clears throat> and that's Miss Val. Yep. For people that don't know, could you give a little like explanation of who she is? And yeah. Even insider scoop to me about do you know anything about why that is that because these girls would literally like do treat anything her, for her yes like nothing right. I've ever seen at the college level mm-hmm. um, obviously if you like Roger if it's his sons and his childhood best friends and he's watched these kids since they're eight these kids are gonna feel like that's their second dad yeah. but to pick up someone at nineteen and then have them for three years and they're like this is my second mom she's taught me everything. How did she get that? How did she do that? So I got to know Miss Val a little bit. Not uh, I, I got her on the tail end of her career when they did when they won in dramatic fashion a couple of years ago. And um, she's a powerful personality. Like she comes into like head coaches meetings and she takes center stage and she's not afraid. And I I always thought that that was pretty pretty amazing you know to someone walk in there you're just super comfortable about who and what you were or at least you act like it you know and you present and you all all about what you are about and you're consistent with it and she was always consistent in either the meetings with her players that I heard about like everything was the same thing um I don't know this for a fact I don't think she was in gymnastics I think she was like she was in choreography or she was a dance or something like that so she got this job and then she created a, a brand or an entity out of it. She didn't know that much about um, a, a, about gymnastics. I think she hired people around her that were the great minds of, of gymnastics to like help facilitate this. And she was so good at connecting with a player where like they could sit, you know, out on about whatever and, and talk about amazing things. And the next day she could be all over them in practice and they wouldn't skip a beat because they knew that Miss Val cared. She always cared. And if you watch all of her, like there's a bunch of stuff on her, like podcasts about there's one about how she had to connect with a certain player and how hard that was. And that player was really not into it. I think there was body image issue. There's a lot of things going on. And she helped really connect and help that young lady become an adult and become a champion. Find the inner like. Coaching is not what people say it is. Coaching is really diving in and finding out how to motivate and make people great at the, at, with their opportunities. You know, for example, you two are, are great at what you guys do. You also have powerful personalities, which is why you're on these, this podcast, while you're doing this, you're finding a whole different avenue of, of tapping a whole different resource of how extravagant, how great you guys really are. And I don't mean that to blow smoke up your butt. It's just, it's one of these things where, you're exploring your talent and you're aggressive with it. And we as coaches need to like fan that flame. We've got to like figure out ways to get you guys to see and to dream. I always say this to recruits. I want dreamers. I want people that dream. 
don't ever put yourself in a box. Like, I, I don't, I don't believe in that. I'm, I'm a kid from Scott's Valley. I never was good at volleyball. I was, oh, I was okay. And now I'm the head coach of USC women's volleyball. Don't tell me that you can't do something. And regardless of whether I deserve the job or not, I've worked to a point where this is my shot and I believe in this. So like, I'm a dreamer. And so I think coaches, the really, you know, a lot of coaches out there when they believe in those kids and their dreams and everything else, and they figure out the art of coaching and how to motivate them to push them in those areas, um, you get some amazing things. So, well, I think that's spot on. Um, the two things that I pick up from a lot of this is the <clears throat> cornerstones, if you were to make a pyramid like wooden of coaching would be caring and consistency. Those Would are definitely you, those similar, those two yes. things kept standing standing out to me. Like your coach has you have to know that that coach cares about you as an individual and about the team's success and then also that person is consistent. Cuz I think yep. if you're consistent, you're more of a rock and people can kind of gravitate towards you. If you're here Correct. and there and here and there, you're wishy-washy, you're not an anchor for people yep. to be able to even depend on as a coach. Uh, you don't know where to latch on and you're supposed to be the leader. So right. if they can't find you and they right. can't, they can't hook on and help. That's exactly. a, a, yeah. No, that's something I think, uh, like at Hawaii, that's our coaching staff would always talk to us about like being a professional, in every aspect of our life. And I think that's exactly like the way you put it being consistent. Cause as a professional, you get paid to be, to show up every single yeah. night and perform at the highest level. And, I think that's exactly a good way to describe me, like being consistent, but in like every aspect of your life. And that's let Mike hit it on the point. That's when coaches trust you. Yep. They can, they know you're gonna make the right decisions when they're not there, and you're in college and everything's going on. That would, that means they can trust you on the court, like all these different things. And so, I think that's for sure consistency is so big and so important. Um, those are huge points. If we it's were hard to, as a coach. It's hard. I mean, yeah. we're, I'm struggling with it. I'm still, I mean, I'm talking about it. I have massive holes that I've got to work on. And I, we all do. We all, we're human and we're trying to figure those things out. And then the always, the, the biggest contributing factor always is your self ego, you know, gets in the way of a lot of these things of how to like get yourself to the next stage and get better at what you're trying to get to. So what if this was a pyramid and we had the two bottom pieces, <clears throat> cornerstones, what would be the top piece? The top one, the top thing. Right. I think at the top, it's always going to be about the results, you know, like, cause, cause at some point you're, you're still competing for whatever so that is. Execution like, or something. Execution. Like that. You know, I, I think that you, you'll have a lot of different bricks or whatever you want to stabilize. And at the very top is kind of like playing the in goal. front of big crowds and the execution and kind of like what you go for, you know, it's, right. you know, it's super bowl. Like it doesn't matter. You're, you're going for excellence. And, and it's just this, this, um, this thing you're always striving for. Right. So um, that one is, it's more of like a byproduct, right? So, right. You know, well, it makes sense that it would be at the top because everything kind of holds it up. Yeah. And I heard the other day, someone said this and I really liked it. I'm, I'm a big quote person, but I, I'll probably butcher as well, but culture, creates behaviors and behaviors create results, you know, and it's like, you're, you got to have this really solid foundation of your culture and be really good. And, and you've got to live by it. And you gotta, you'll be tested with that tremendously and, and you can't bend or break on those. And then that will then because of those will, will dictate what the behavior is that matches what you have to do to get this culture. Mm -hmm. And then hopefully you have enough talent and you have people that buy and that that creates the wins and losses of the top of the pyramid that you're talking about. How do you create a culture at a top school like USC or UCLA? Because I've heard of the culture at UCSB. It's yeah. defense, undersized, ball control, for at least for the men's side. Yeah. Right? It's like that kind of culture. Like <clears throat> there's the Hawaii culture. There's all these subcultures that I feel like almost rely on a chip on the shoulder, if that makes sense. Um, how, what is the culture at a UCLA when people are like, what's the culture at UCLA? I'm like, man, it's hard. It's yeah. hard for us to kind of come up with something like, but yet the best programs in football, I'm sure do. And the best programs in uh, basketball, I'm sure do. I just mm -hmm. don't know how they're doing that. How is, 
Bill Belichick has a culture, but that's almost oh, yeah. the un- that's almost the underdog as well. He takes <laughs> you're, you're guys seeing a that- backlash of that with Tom Brady now. Like Tom Brady's a whole different person. No, no offense, but like you're seeing a whole yes. different side of Tom Brady that he never had. One hundred million percent. But yeah. that relies on like he takes the Wes Welkers, he takes mm-hmm. like the Tom Brady's, and then those guys have chips on their shoulders, and he's like, "This we're gonna do it the right way." Yeah. How do you do it when you're getting all the top guys? Say you're Alabama. So, or your USC. Uh, I, I, well, I, so I think that there's all these jokes. At least I heard about. It's not Nick Saban. It's Nick Satan, right? There's all he's 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 a hard ass. He's tough. He's rat poison. I mean, you you hear? I mean, we all watch those things, and he's he comes across as the biggest jerk. He and Belichick are the biggest jerks of all times in, in media and everything else. But I think they're just so true to their values. My guess is they're hard on their kids, but I bet you all those players for the most, I mean, it's a big squad, love Saban. They love playing for Saban because he's so concrete in what he's got there or what he believes in. And it's probably, we can guess it, you know, it's, it's obviously going to be, you got to earn your stripes and you got to work hard. And you, I mean, don't ever complain about anything because you get to, you don't got to. And, you know, there's like, there's a bunch of other stuff, but he's very specific in it. And if you even a little bit, he puts you on blast. He puts you on blast. It just happened the other day where he talked about some guy that's super talented. And, and he said, at the end of the day, he has to figure it out. If he doesn't figure it out, this is not the right spot for him. He did that in a public media thing. That was, that was him calling his guy out. He has do no you think problem that, that Do you think that that culture of football as a football coach is easier it's easier done for him than someone in a volleyball landscape with volleyball kids where the oh, culture yeah. itself is different oh yeah and I do you think you, that, i mean you you can go into so many worlds like i mean it's like volleyball is an affluent sport you know it costs a lot of money to play the game for a lot it's a different clientele sometimes football you can get you know individuals that are scrapping to try to make to get a meal so they're just hungry at the bit and everything, the different societies and different struggles and different everything they bring to the table is different. So football is a little bit more smash mouth and in your face and you got to go. Like no matter what anyone says, it's still, you, you, you listen to them. It's like, it's, it's all gas and no brakes. That's what Salah says at, at the, with the New York Jets. I mean, it's football mentality. You go in there with women's volleyball and say that all the time. I, I don't know if they're, they're going to probably look at you and go, what do you mean? What are you talking about? Right. So... I think it's about trying to figure out and we're all trying to do it. You know, we try to do it at UCLA with uh, John, 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 myself and Celia and myself. We're trying to do it here at USC. And at the end of the day, you're, you're saying Santa Barbara. Well, Santa Barbara is a different entity than a UCLA or a USC, right? You know, it's, it's some schools get more than others because they have football programs and there's more money coming in. And so there's different certain sta- uh, standards or uh, standards, not uh, circumstances that you have to overcome. Uh, it's different issues for each program. It would be really awesome if some of these power five programs that get a lot of resources find ways to put the chip on the shoulder of these athletes. Um, I try to avoid, and I mean, you know this, I mean, I try as best I can to avoid the LeBron James syndromes, which is uh, you've been told you've been great and special your entire life. You're the best player of your team. Everyone bow down to you, uh, bow, uh, bows down to you. You get away with anything that you want. You might be a great kid, have a great family, but unfortunately, you're being told these things that Sproul would always say, like you're unique, you're not special. You know, nobody's special. Like you're unique, you're different. That doesn't make you way better than anybody else. It means you got to come to work and you got to do the same things that everyone else does. So I think that you have to find those types of kids and. You've got to really be in some ways like a Nick Saban or very concrete in what you believe in. And maybe that's defining roles like you guys indicated earlier, or maybe it's not. And just that these are the five things that we do. And there's no, you do not deviate from this at all. And if you do, and you're the number one player in the world, that's great. You go, you leave. Right. So. Do you think that kids at higher, I don't even want to say it like that, but. Do you think a kid like at the Duke or Alabama or the top universities and they're getting the top kids, the top recruits, do you think that they need 
more love because of that effect where they don't even think they're that good because everyone's told them they have more self-doubt? Or do you think that they need someone to put them in their place more? I think it's a case by case. It's, it all comes down to like you're up. I, I mean, I, I, either of you, I could either love, love you or I could get on you guys because of how your family has raised you. You guys were raised to be tough. Like it's, it was, um, you guys were never handed anything from what I get. I mean, you always earned everything that you had and you were always told to be humble and to be grateful and to help others. And so I think that if you take you two and you put them into, it doesn't matter, a Saban or a Krzyzewski or whatever it is, I think that it would be different for you two than it would be for, I don't know, someone else in a different way or whatever, if they've been told they've been great their entire life or they've been told right. they're terrible and they're, they don't, they're not worth anything or I think it's all you have to figure out again, art of coaching a little bit. You have to figure out your player, what really makes them tick or how you can motivate them. Where do you stress them? Where do you make sure that they can fail properly? Cause failure is a big thing. It's a good thing. And it's, so I think it changes, I guess. Joe, if it's sorry, football, been... it's numbers though, right? Football. I mean, you got like 80, you got whatever yeah. it is. It's just numbers. It's what it is. If you don't want to do get the hell out. Right. So that's, uh... My whole career, I've loved, like, I read more stuff on, I, I rarely go look stuff up on, like, volleyball coaches, volleyball players. I love yeah. looking at other sports and figuring out ways to tie that into my own career or my own pathway or my teen's pathway. It's so interesting. So um, I like I like kind of bringing those, the mindset of those top coaches from other sports into volleyball to see and how athletes in volleyball would fit into the programs like that and I think it would be tough on a lot of – there's a lot of all oh, athletes yeah. that I don't think would be able to yeah, play for well, coaches for sure. like that. Like I, I yeah. even see like today, like most kids couldn't even play for my dad in a lot of club volleyball. Like That's my right. dad's – I think, and I think my dad's realized that actually to be honest. Re, um, and he doesn't coach as many teams anymore and he's just is kind of more helping out with some skill development. And then he's – he realizes that for sure. He's just like he and he can't and he can't coach any other way. It's just like I don't think Nick Saban, I don't think Mike Krzyzewski, I don't think they can coach any other way. Like when they go in the gym, they and that's cannot. why you see coaches. That's how you see coaches like retiring now. They're straight up saying, "Yeah, I just don't know how to deal with it. I can't coach any other way. This is the way I do it." And the kids just it's not working, so I just need to retire and step away. And I think that's actually the best solution rather than trying to, because as a coach. Players sense immediately when you're not being like true to yourself. Or you're not like when you try to adapt and you try to change yourself and change your personality and be false. I've seen it. I've played for coaches in my career that have tried to do that. And it's just as like you lose respect immediately by doing that. So that's right. The uh, there's two. I, uh, there, there, there's a quote I'll send you guys about hard coaching and hard coaching. It basically comes down to your. You're, you're, you're being coached hard because if we don't coach you hard, we're setting you up for failure in your real life. And, and, uh, and it, it goes into detail about it. I won't ruin that, but I'll get it to you guys. And at the end of the day, if, you know, if you don't see that we care as coaches, cause we're hard on you, then you are blind. You know, you're blind with this. You have to understand that we want the, what's best for you. And so you have to like allow us in to help. And hopefully we know what we're doing, right? Hopefully we're not, bunch of jackasses just faking it right <laughs> the blind so. leading the blind <laughs> yeah right <laughs> <laughs> no totally that I, yeah that'd be great please sh share that uh with us we'll get that up on our page too um mm -hmm. but there's two things i said at the beginning before you hopped on that i want to hit with you we'll huh? see how long they each take i if you got to run at any point you just let us know you hop off um I'm good one besides usc women's volleyball team Who's the top team in the country this year in your eyes? I mean, for us, we, we did this last year before the women's season. And we I, kind of picked. And I thought. guess the and I guess the champion. Yeah, like it did. They were really good. They were I really guess, good. I guess who won at the beginning of the year? No, you you did you choose at the beginning of the year or the beginning of the tournament? <laughs> yeah. No, the beginning of the year, I think. <laughs> I, I don't know about maybe. But maybe. Could, I can't remember. I can't exactly remember. I can't remember. remember. Somebody might go back. Yeah. yeah. We'll have to go check that out. We'll have Gage check. That's his job since yeah. since his Wi-Fi is down. He's in an apartment in Bulgaria. 
they turned his Wi-Fi off. <laughs> We're like, Mike and I. Great time. Oh yeah, Mike and I are laughing because he would give us so much crap for like if we couldn't get stuff working or we had Wi-Fi issues in Europe. And now he's de- first first week he's dealing oh, with yeah. it. Oh yeah, so <laughs> glad. I paid the guy to turn on it off. Uh, yeah. Oh. Oh, so, interesting. Okay. Yeah, this is second he's time avoiding on, and G, the real G Swizzle hasn't been on for <laughs> okay. either one. He's avoiding so, you. Yeah, it's, it's unbelievable. Uh, who do I think? You know, he's, I haven't really seen, um, I, again, until you actually see them in action, you don't really know, so it's all based off of paper. But I will say this, I think in the women's side, in order to compete in a Final Four, you have to have two big-time pins that can hit the ball and send it off the block 40 feet. Like you have to have people that can light up the court and out of system situations. You have to have a decent libero and you have to have the setter. And so I think programs that have big time setters and at least one big time pin are gonna be factors. Um, I know that Why all the blockers out there are really angry with me by me saying that, but it's okay. You guys are still important, but um, if, go ahead. Why is that? I just think at the end of the day, when you match up, it's going to be like, who can get you out of certain scenarios? I just think that finals was, it was, uh, you got Skyler and uh, Logan versus Stumbler and um, the, 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 the sisters, right? Yeah. On, on the, so I, I, and I think that that's. Stumbler was a, a beast. I was, I, I, I first time I'd seen her. I'm yeah. like, holy oh, she's I legit. was really but impressed what, by her. Do you think that the woman on the woman's side, the setter is more important than on the men's side? I no? actually do to this point why is that so i just think that uh they have to like there's uh, on the guy side it seems like there's been a lot more guys that jump and hang in the air a little bit longer so it gives them a little bit bigger windows i think on the women's side the windows are a little bit smaller but the technique and skill are way better than the guys i would completely i want to make this very clear that. to everyone out there in public i'm not a scientist i don't know it's just a thought that's no, I would completely agree with it. On the women's side, they are just yeah. so much more technical. And on the so men's side, it's just a little bit more athleticism. A but the guy just jumps and hangs in the air and tries to hit as hard as he can. And so there's right. just this big old, like, you don't have to be so precise with with that, which is why I that think. That makes a lot of you, sense. You know, when, when Joe, reason why if you were able to thread really small windows. Micah, you were able to thread small windows. Josh Tuniga was able to thread really small windows. You were fine. Listen, we, we, we gave you Dana though. We gave we, we, we gave you Kofi. Exactly. That was your one. I wasn't one, able to. I wasn't. Window. I wasn't able to thread small windows. Just but that uh, you have to. I just think you if you consistently you got to have two big ba- uh, big big pin bangers and you got to have a really big time setter. And you got to so, have a libero that doesn't like choke it. Basically, is what I'm saying. You can have an okay <laughs> libero and, and win, but you, I mean, if you have a great libero, that's fantastic. But no I've joking. seen teams win, but if you're if you're a libero and you're being noticed for the wrong reasons in the final four, that's not great. Right, right. Are right, you calling right, I'm right. trying to think who you're calling out from this final four. Which libero? No, no, no. I actually there's no, actually, no, no there's, oh, there, what I just said had nothing to do with this final four. I'm thinking right, about right, the right. men's a couple years back, you know, back in the day. So okay. Everyone's gonna be like, well, Brad means this. No, I, I don't. He does, guys. He does. <laughs> there's somebody. There's somebody, somebody in the back find of his mind. What he's talking about? Yeah. <laughs> somebody find it. Yeah. There's somebody in the back. But so, okay, just from that. Do you? Th- I mean, you, I know you don't want to throw any. Texas. Are you? Texas, okay. Nebraska will be up there. Um, Wisconsin, I assume. Wisconsin will be up there. Uh, well, it's going to depend. Like, and I don't mean that Wisconsin is so good in areas, but they actually graduated one of their big outside hitters. So who do they have coming in? That's fire, I, and I think they have plenty. Don't get me wrong. I thought Haggerty was supposed to come back. I think and she's I just not saw... coming back. I think she. I, I think she's done. Recky I... came back, but I think Haggerty's not coming back. So yeah. we'll see how that, how that goes. Nebraska's got a lot of firepower on the pin, um, and, and, and great setting. I think you've got Florida's got great pin firepower. Like I just, I think you go down. Baylor's going to be in the mix because they have now two. They have Skinner and they've got. Um, Presley on the outside. I think that's a real deal type of team, especially Presley, who is playing at a whole different level um, height wise than anyone else. I think, uh, I think Stanford is going to end up being good. You know, I think they're young and they didn't get a lot of training in last year. I think they went through a lot. So I think you're going to see a big development with them. I think they're going to start off. Well, I don't know how they're going to start off, but they have a really hard road to begin with, but I think they're going to, 
you're going to see them elevate quick. And I think Washington is uh, is really good. You have a really great set of there. You got uh, big firepower on the pins. They're a Final Four team, so you know. And it's going to be interesting to see what Kentucky does, right? I mean, Kentucky, they still got Stumbler. You still got one of the Skinners. You've got, uh, I think, Rutherford, whatever her name is, the big lefty opposite. Who's the new setter? Who's the new libero? What does that look like? I think they can be another team that's very, very good as well. There's a lot of possibilities. Penn State is good. People don't know about that. They got some transfers that can hit the ball hard, so they'll be good. That's the thing about women's volleyball. I mean, <laughs> with so, so many, many players. Yeah. yeah. Men's yeah, side, so it's like, teams. all right, these three teams are the ones who are going to be yeah. in the hunt. So, And I think I, I think that any one that I mentioned to me is not a shock. I think outside of that is still not a shock. I still think there's – I mean, UCLA is good. Oregon's good. Washington State's good. I mean, there's – I can go through uh, – Western Kentucky's good. Uh, BYU's good. USD's good. Creighton's good. Like, I can go – there's a bunch of great teams that are going to make big runs and do a lot of damage. And I'm missing a bunch of teams that are still – Yeah. It's fun. It's fun to see everything's back. We're, are you guys going to yeah. be having fans? I, right now, fingers crossed, we're going to have some fans. So come on down, have some popcorn, you know, enjoy, relax, and uh, watch some volleyball on our new floor. And uh, hopefully it's – I think it's such a relief to just get some sort of normalcy these days. So Totally. Something. I'm glad you, know, you guys like, got a new floor. That old one was just – Not <laughs> Not great. Yeah. What are you talking about? That thing was – <laughs> I think it was brand new. It was really good. I know. Yeah. I know. <laughs> so SC, I know. SC money. Out. <laughs> there was uh there was actually holes in it, and so it cost a lot of money to uh, fix it. And we wanted to go Terraflex anyways. So what a great oh, nice. excuse going to. Ter- oh, sick. Yeah. Okay, so we have the Terraflex uh, the terraflex down, is and um, so we're just gonna too. throw it over the basketball. Yeah, we'll throw it over the the basketball floor. Sick. And then uh, and if and if anyone's familiar with Galen Center, it's 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 like a concrete floor, and they they put these big wedges or pieces together to make the floor on top of it because you can have concerts in there. It's an all-purpose facility, so right. that's what we'll do. We'll just roll it over the top. It'll be good. Right on. Cool. Last qu- last question, then we're gonna let you go. I have to ask this because we touched about it last week, but I, I not a whole lot. You are connected on the men's side with the USA program. In your eyes, like what sort of happened? We had TJ on last week to talk, and yeah. he was pretty open I, about I a lot of things. Um, and there's some really, good. yeah, it was really interesting actually to hear uh, his perspective. But what, in your eyes, I don't know if you've had a chance to talk to John. I we actually uh, spoke with uh, with him this past week. Um, not so much about that, but we. Uh, I, I just want to get your perspective on what kind of in your eyes what happened there from a group that. Obviously yeah. went from bronze medal team, a lot of experienced guys with numerous years at the top clubs in the world, and what kind of panned out in in Tokyo and uh, and I mean obviously the women's side is a completely different story, but I just wanted to get your perspective on the men's side. Oh, don't worry, I got plenty of, of uh, opinions about it. I think uh, I'm very much protecting or protective of the men's side. Um, and I'm just going to throw some things out there that can people can kind of toss around or one side or the other. When you don't have Aaron Russell there, it's like not having Jordan Larson there. And so who's the next person off the bench for the women's side after Jordan Larson? Because Jordan Larson was that important to them. Um, and so I thought TJ did a phenomenal job. And he, he told you guys, like he had to go in there and he had to deal with, well, you're not Aaron Russell. That told you exactly how big of a deal it was not to have Aaron Russell. And even if Aaron Russell doesn't start for you, just having the depth of Aaron Russell, a, a, a 6'9 or 6'10 outside hitter, that's one of the top three or four players in the world or whatever he was ranked. Yeah, that's a big deal. It's a really, really, really big deal. And then you had a lot of younger guys on the team that I thought deserved to be on the team, did a great job. But it's at the end of the day, not having Aaron Russell and that experience does hurt more than anyone's willing to admit to. And that makes it tough. The other thing is, I don't know if this is a fact or not, but I kept hearing rumors that Taylor Sander was, was nursing wounds and trying to battle through stuff. And so I, was he practicing? Was I mean, there's so many questions that could be with that because there's rhythm with all that stuff. And then the other thing that people need to really understand is, is that if you watched the first match, would you have guessed that France would have won a gold? No, no shot. France was the most pathetic looking team I've ever seen in the Olympics. And that team ended up winning. I think the Olympics is the most ridiculous field in the most stressful situations. I have never been there. 
So uh, it's, but even watching on TV, every single team on the guy's side was good. Maybe minus one or two. And the fact that Argentina, by the way, they were good. Loser. We know Loser. We love Loser. So I sent him a message before. He's awesome. He was in France with me and we would always talk. I sent him a message before. <laughs> And I was like, oh, my God, the freaking bronze medal matches today. And then he got, yeah. he won. And I was like, bro, it was so I know. Crazy. But that was a team that supposedly should not even been up there. They, <laughs> they, they beat Brazil. So what does that say about I me? Mean, oh, no. Like, there's so many factors with the Olympics. It's such a grueling tournament. And this is the last part, which I will get blown up for, and I don't care. If you look at the pipelines for men's volleyball, women's volleyball, the whole theme has always been trying to build up the men's side of volleyball so we have more depth for the national pipeline. We need more good volleyball players. And I still think that if you looked at our women's side, and I think they did a phenomenal job. I'm so fired up for them. The team chemistry was unreal. Karch's speech at the end or, like, the emotion, like, the what they went through was was fantastic. Jordan Thompson goes down, Annie Drews, what a story that is. Micah lit it up. We didn't even know if Jordan was coming back. I mean, there's so many amazing things on the women's side. But now being over here, I, there's a lot of players I watch in college, and I go, wow, oh, that kid's, that kid's going to be in that mix. That kid is going to be good. That kid's, And it's just a bigger, it's a bigger pipeline right now than the men's side. That's what I think. I think we're getting there. On the men's side, I think it's 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 getting more and more and more and more. But that's why you, you hear all this push for trying to expand and get more college programs on the men's side. We're trying to, to expand it so we have more opportunity. There are amazing athletes out there that are not playing volleyball on the men's side. And so we're, that's that's kind of like, I guess, my argument or my other side of it. And then I don't know, the volleyball level was just so good on both. I mean, it was <laughs> – that was good volleyball. That yeah. was good. No, it I was. feel bad for them. I know they cared. I know they, they gave everything. I know, I think TJ was, you know, everyone's going to talk about the serves. Like people talk about certain things, but I, I don't know. I just, tournaments are tournaments. You'd be, I mean, everyone knows that. You can have everything going right, and one thing can, can kind of go awry, and it's, it, it just, it, it can unravel the whole thing. It, it, you just, that's how hard it is. That's why it's so incredibly difficult. And that's why we as coaches always tell you guys, don't you're up by 15 points. You got to get the You got to get the next point. You cannot allow a team to ever feel like they have a breath or a chance or whatever it is. So um, it's a great perspective. I'm super proud of both. I, I'm so fired up for the women to get their first gold. The Jordan Larson gets the last kill. Like I just, how amazing that is. You can mm -hmm. see the passion. I feel so devastated for the guys. I feel for them. I know a lot of them. They're incredible guys. That's an incredible team. And, you know, you pick up the pieces and you try to come back and you go after France, which is only three years away. And you got a lot of motivation and away we go. We're totally. USA. Absolutely. Well, coach, th you go to Hawaii pretty soon too. I don't mean you to do. Shop. You go to Honolulu in if, two weeks. Go uh, both. If they don't shut this, the, the state down, yes. Egays, yeah. Egays. <clears throat> threatening that i keep reading yeah. so the uh that well that'll sweet. be sweet no fans which is kind of a bummer that sucks that's part of the reason why i wanted to take the yeah. kids over there was to play in front of the, that crowd is something special you know it's it's a different it's a different environment than that and byu and you know there's a couple places that are just different than anywhere else so yeah that alone like is why i would go to hawaii in yeah. if i had to choose it again like <laughs> after playing in front of those crowds it's like you remember those nights like so, so vividly. Fun. It's so fun to play there. Um, I don't remember the fake slide to Solberg or whatever it was. The, <laughs> the slide you ran instead of the front one, and that, that everyone goes insane. So oh, on Pep, the kid, yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah. the kid, I saw, I see him every once in a while. He's like, you yeah. got, you're the one who <laughs> every single time that video gets posted, it gets sent to me. It's like the hang, and then all of a sudden it's the uh, like yeah, the last. Well, second. Pl I play with Solberg now, and we've been <laughs> past. Through two weeks, we've been working on the slide to bring it back Good. in the bo in the bring boot. Here. Our no coach loves it. Do with that. <laughs> Our coach have loves slide it. Slide in the inside C, but it's like a big tempo, and yeah. just let them fly in there. Holy smokes! Good luck. Exactly. You got Jordan yeah. hitting freaking super fast balls. But I know we're gonna let you go here. <laughs> we held you way good. too long. Yeah. Um, good luck tomorrow, coach. Appreciate we'll be watching. It. That's awesome.
Love you guys. We'll Thank I've you been for following along. you guys all summer. Uh, for anyone that doesn't know, I mean, you guys should uh, obviously, if you're watching this, then you're probably following. But absolutely, out of system official is the uh, entertainment of the summer. Unbelievable volleyball creativity, and I tell everyone I talk to that you need this is how you play volleyball. This is what you have to try to like aspire to be in this sort of thing. So keep up what you guys are doing. It's good stuff, man. Thank you, Coach. Appreciate You're the man, Coach. It. All right. Good luck out there. Be good. And uh, I'll be in touch with you guys at some point. Later. Sounds good. Peace, coach. Yeah. You can, you can handle the heat. Yeah. Huge, 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 huge thank you to the one and only coach Brad Keller. He's one of the, my top two, three favorite coaches on the planet, for sure. I don't know. I've, had, I've only had great experiences with him, playing for him getting to know him. I think everybody who listened to the first time we had him on kind of got to know our relationship with him. So this time we wanted to keep it more about his philosophy, what he's got going on with this program and just coaching across the U.S. And I think he had some really good insight today on that. It's it's crazy just the evolution of athletes and, and kind of the shift away from the old school approach. I don't know. Was there What was like the one thing that stood out to you the most about how he approaches his team and his program and running that? Gosh, I think it's like, it's a weird time right now because like he said, it's such a in-between zone of like new school and old school that a lot of people I think are trying to manage and balance with like just how much information there is out there and what science is out there and the even like from a psychology standpoint and like having all this information, um, statistics and um, data analytics, and then having to be like, how do I, what do I do with this? You know what I mean? Like, do I throw it out the window and try and just make my team compete or do I use some of it and keep it to myself? Am I sharing this all with them? How much am I basing my, my practice plans around purely what I feel or about how, what our numbers look like? It's like an interesting time to be a coach. I think it's a lot. And as well as thinking about how much, coaches do that's not volleyball at the college level um we didn't even touch on that but d1 college coaches for volleyball i don't for football it's probably less for volleyball they do so much administration it's, it's ridiculous crazy. like i would never want to be a head coach for like one half ha- half maybe ha- maybe more than half the job like at a school like hawaii oh. a huge i know for a fact like, more than half the job more than half the job and it's just not like volleyball. fundraising it's fundraising. It's just straight fundraising like, or compliance or yeah. NCAA or like there's like countless things people don't think of that they're doing. It's so Crazy. insane. But I really enjoyed that talk. I think it's the two things I picked up from him were um, to care about your, your athletes and to be consistent as a, just as a person as well as as a coach. And he demonstrates um, that like better than anybody. Like every single time you talk to him, he's so like – I don't know. He's one of the easiest people to talk to in the volleyball world. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He's so easy to talk to. I owe that guy a lot. I mean, that's who recruited me to UCLA and coached me there for my first. Actually, I think it's three years, but I think it's two. Uh, felt like three. Might have been three. Um, probably three. I have a terrible memory. <laughs> but incredible guy at first. And then really good coach, too. Knows a lot about volleyball. Uh, has a super good mind. He's super sharp. Hopefully they can do well. I, I hope I so. Nothing I really hope. Like, I'm not a huge the, USC fan, but I want him to do well. That's the woman's program that I want to see do well right now is just because how closely connected we are with him. So hopefully yeah. they can do super well and make, make a run at it. That would be incredible for him. And I feel like the Pac-12 isn't crazy good right now where like there is definitely a slot for a couple teams to do well this year. But totally. We're going to sign it off here. Again, huge thank you to Dr. Price's Electrolytes for partnering with us and being along the ride with us. They were, they've helped us so much throughout the summer, and they're going to they've continue that They've saved multiple people just along the way. Absolutely. Absolutely. Not even da- us. But. Down below, use the promo code. Please, please, please use the promo code when you use it. You guys get percentage off, and it just lets them know that uh, people are— We're doing a good job. Exactly. We're doing a good job, and— 
it actually we, we would not push a product on you if we didn't like it if we didn't use it and this summer we seriously use the whole time it tastes super good and it, it just helped like micah said there's so many people this we were handing packets out all summer yeah. nobody had any complaints Everybody if you are playing in a volleyball tournament uh like yeah. you need some of this stuff dr price's um, light ends down below you're drinking here. if you're out drinking or something like that you might need some of this all bus if you, <laughs> if you get all bus well that's that dr price electrolyte right. huge thank you um this has been another episode of if you can't handle the heat presented by out of system joe and micah out gauge ditching on the boys again thank you everybody we'll see you next week